Hey, have you heard the latest about dividend investing, that is? If so, you might be a little confused. Well, fear not, because I'm here to give you the straight scoop. Hey, I'm Wes Wood, the income guy and founder and president of Wood Financial Group. And for nearly 20 years, I've specialized in helping hardworking Tennesseans just like you reach their retirement goals through income-based financial strategies. And hey, if you're looking for the right solutions to achieve your own financial goals, I can help. Just reach out to me at retiretv.com or by calling 615-826-5749 during today's show or at any time. And if you've watched my show before, you know investing for income is a strategy on, based on, on generating income through interest and dividends. Most people understand how interest works, but fewer understand how dividends work. And the headlines and the hype in the financial media can make the topic even more confusing. So today, I'm going to give you the straight scoop on dividends. And I'll talk about what dividends are and how they work, the benefits and the potential risk of investing for dividends, and why now might be a great time to invest for dividend income if you have the right risk tolerance. And joining me on this week's show again is David Scranton. David is an investing for income specialist with over 30 years of experience. He's also a best-selling author and a television host. But before we welcome Dave, let's cover some of the basics about dividends. So very simply, dividends are payments made to stockholders by companies based on the company's profits. When you own a dividend paying stock, you're getting a share of the company's profits. And if the dividend has an, a dividend reinvestment program, that's called a drip program, where you can actually reinvest your dividends and buy more of their shares. Or you can choose to keep your existing dividend shares and spend those dividends as income. But either way, Dividend investing allows you to create an income stream from your investment by also giving you the potential for more portfolio growth. And obviously, the income feature is why dividend investing is a part of the income model. But there are some big differences between investing for dividends and investing for interest. For example, the bond and the bond-like instruments that generate interest are contract-based investments that protect not only your, your income, but also your principal if you hold the bond until maturity. But by contrast, there's no dividend strategy that contractually protects both your return and your principal. And naturally, that's going to make dividend investing riskier than investing for interest. But it's also important to understand different dividend strategies have different levels of risk. And here, here are two more important things to keep in mind. One, no investment is completely risk-free. And two, everyone has their own personal risk tolerance. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a bit. But right now, you can learn more by reading my timely report called Investing for Income in the Stock Market. And it comes in your free retirement income kit. And you can get that kit by visiting retiretv.com or by calling 615-826-5749. But now, let's welcome back David Scranton. He's the founder of Sound Income Strategies and the Retirement Income Store. Hey, David, thank you for joining me again today. Yeah, of course. Uh, looks like, uh, let me see, looks like you might have had a little bit of a haircut there since I saw you last, or am I just imagining things? A, a, a little bit, maybe a little more uh, uh, slick back, right? A little bit, there you but, go. Uh, I do need a haircut, so maybe next time you see me, it will be actually cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, pro more product is always a good replacement for not having a haircut, right? Um, <laughs> that's, so, that's right. You know, you said something about you know how most uh, you know most strategies that are dividend based don't protect your principal and really don't protect your income, but preferred stocks are really kind of sort of one exception to that, right? Yeah, I mean preferred stocks um, kind of look and act like a bond. Um, the price is pretty sticky because they, they tend to trade kind of close to par value and, and we have a, a posted dividend that we know we're going to get from the preferred stock. Uh, although the principal and the dividend is not necessarily guaranteed, contractually guaranteed like a, like a bond, 
but a preferred stock really kind of looks and, and acts like a bond and the dividends can be very consistent and, and the price is very sticky and, and typically the yields can be quite a bit higher than a traditional bond because there is a little bit more risk because it's a dividend payer instead of a in interest-based payment. Mm -hmm. So in forgetting blue chip common stocks and all, um, can you share with the audience some other things that are we call you know part of the the bond like world where they pay dividends and and but really they're they're not as sticky as a preferred. Yep, yep. So yeah, other uh, types of instruments inside of the the income model. Of course, you've got the the corporate bond world, the municipal bond world, preferred stock world. But other dividend payers like preferred stocks are things like uh, REITs and BDCs. Uh, REITs are real estate investment trusts. So. What you can do is actually buy or own a stock of a company that owns a bunch of income producing real estate. And so as a shareholder of the real estate investment trust, um, all the properties that are within the real estate, of course, investment are generating income like rent checks. And as a holder of that stock, you get a dividend based on the cash flow that the real estate investment trust is collecting. Uh, then you've got BDCs, Business Development Corporations, which if you, if you kind of peel it back, it's, it's like investment banks. They're in the business to, to loan money. And they're not loaning money out to individuals like you and me. They're loaning money out to companies, but not huge companies that are going to issue corporate bonds because, of course, if a company is big enough to issue a corporate bond, they're not going to go through a, a, a bank and pay extra finance charges, but also not to little bitty companies that are going to go down to a local uh, bank to get a check. So those BDCs kind of fill in the gap there and you can buy and own the stock and then you get the, the dividend based on the, uh, the loans being paid back over time. So you've got a few different instruments inside the, uh, the interest and dividend column. Yeah, and the, you're right. They, it, it, BDCs apply really, they service that between market. And BDCs and REITs do well if you think interest rates are going to go up, which is great. But it's all a question of risk tolerance, isn't it? Because each of these things has a different risk level. Yeah, absolutely. So if somebody's very conservative, not looking for a lot of risk, um, then they probably may not want to put too much money into REITs and BDCs. But if somebody's comfortable with maybe taking a little bit more risk uh, and having a higher risk tolerance, then those types of instruments or a combination of those instruments can be really solid income generating types of investments that will pay interest and dividends. And Dave, uh, thank you for the questions and, and stay with us, David, and we're going to talk more in just a bit. But coming back after the break, I'll talk more about the similarities and the differences between various dividend investing strategies. I'm Westwood, the Income Guy, and you're watching the Retirement Income Show. Fiduciary is someone legally obligated to act in your best interest. Doctors, lawyers, and some financial advisors are fiduciaries, but not all. When you work with Wes Wood and his team at Wood Financial Group, you are working with fiduciaries. They help clients create customized investment portfolios based off their retirement goals. If you're ready to work with a fiduciary, visit RetireTV.com and schedule a free, no obligation conversation with Wes or a Wood Financial Group advisor. Hi, I'm Wesley Wood, host of the Retirement Income Show, and I'm founder and president of Wood Financial Group. And we're a local independent financial services company that specializes in creating custom retirement solutions tailored to meet your particular needs. Visit retiretv.com to learn how we can help you create a customized retirement portfolio. Hi, I'm Wesley Wood, host of the Retirement Income Show, and I'm founder and president of Wood Financial Group. And we're a local independent financial services company that specializes in creating custom retirement solutions tailored to meet your particular needs. Visit retiretv.com to learn how we can help you create a customized retirement portfolio. Hey, welcome back. I'm Wes Wood, the Income Guy, and thanks for joining me today as I give you the straight scoop on dividends. So, so far, what we've done is we've covered some of the dividend basics. But now, let's talk about what makes a good dividend strategy. And overall, the main thing with a good dividend investor is what they're looking for is dividend safety. 
they make that determination in, in several different ways. And one of those is, is by comparing the company's earnings uh, to its dividend payouts. For example, if a company is, is earning $5 per share and they're paying a $2.50 per share dividend, it has a 50% dividend payout ratio. And generally, you consider that a pretty safe dividend since the company has plenty of extra cash to invest elsewhere after they pay their shareholders. But dividends depend on other things too, earnings and cash flow, so both really should be considered. And dividend safety is also determined by how new or, or stable an industry is. And we know that can always change. And we saw that recently with the COVID-19 crisis. The pandemic made industries like airlines, restaurants, and hotels suddenly unstable. And at the same time, it increased the stability of other industries like tech, healthcare, and consumer goods. Overall, the bottom line is when seeking dividend safety is to look for companies that have a reliable history of stable earnings and cash flow. And with these guidelines in mind, you can then choose to focus your strategy on either high dividend yield or high dividend growth. And I'm going to talk about those in just a minute with Dave. But in the meantime, take this opportunity to learn more by getting your free retirement income kit by visiting retiretv.com or by calling my office directly at 615-826-5749. But now, let's welcome back income specialist David Scranton. Welcome back, David. Thanks, Wes. You know, you're so good at taking complex concepts and making them simple that I'd like to ask you to explain this concept the way you typically do. And that is the confusion that I hear when people come to me and say, yes, I understand I have to go from growth to income. And you're talking about a dividend yield strategy, but I'm already in this dividend growth strategy. So if you could explain the differences and also, you know, tell us which one you think might make more sense for somebody on the brink of retirement. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to dividend growth versus just investing for dividends in common stocks. Um, if you're investing in a high dividend growth strategy, what you're, what you're investing in is companies that may be paying a, a, a lower than average dividend currently in the hopes that those companies are going to increase their dividends over time, which, again, may or may not work out because we're, we're basing the income on perhaps an increasing dividend over time. So we're hoping that that, in, that dividend does increase. However, just a high dividend paying strategy currently means that we're investing in companies that have substantial cash flow to support the current dividend rate that they're paying. And maybe we don't expect the dividend to necessarily increase over time like the high dividend growth strategy. But I'll say for, for, for most people, and everybody's situation is different, keep in mind that folks that are close to at or in retirement that have the, the risk tolerance are going to focus more on the, the dividends that are already high now because they're looking for current income or they're looking for a little bit less risk or they're looking for the option to reinvest those high dividends to get some more organic growth out of the portfolio. I kind of thought you'd go there and say that, but of course, as we always talk about on the show, the reality is uh, it's never one size fits all, correct? Exactly right. Everybody's situation is different. Risk tolerance is one of the things we want to definitely consider, but there are a lot of different things we need to look at before you know, putting together a portfolio for somebody that's wanting to invest. And it's funny because I know risk tolerance for most people, they think about, okay, their, their psychological ability to withstand risk without being unduly stressed, but risk tolerance you know, is really much more than just psychological. You're right, Dave. And just because somebody can stomach the idea of losing a lot of money if the stock market drops, maybe even half of their money, it doesn't mean that they need to be in high risk. It doesn't necessarily mean because they've got the, the psychological component to be able to take that kind of risk. If their time frame, for instance, doesn't uh, factor in as well, we could be in trouble. Um, so we need to look at other things like age, what's the goals with this money, what's the purpose of the money, and then time horizon. Because, for instance, if somebody's just a, a couple of years out from retirement or already retired, 
um, they probably don't need to be taking nearly as much risk as, as 10 years ago. Even though they may psychologically be comfortable with taking that kind of risk, it may not be the right thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. Exactly right, Dave. Well, it's interesting too because sometimes I know you and I both break it down between people's I need goals versus their I have goals. And sometimes how you allocate risk and investments toward one or the other depends upon whether it's something they need or just something they want, correct? Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. So depending on what the, again, what the purpose of this money, uh, we need to invest it for that purpose. So if they you know need to have something, we're gonna invest it differently than just to simply want to have something, exactly. Mm -hmm. And also, when you've worked with people over the course of, gosh, you know, 20 years almost, uh, you know, do you find that their risk tolerance changes over time sometimes? And, and if so, why might that happen? Oh, yeah, you, you got that right. That's definitely something that you got to stay on top of, uh, either if you're an individual investor or if you're an investment advisor coaching somebody. Uh, what I've seen is that a, that a true retirement income specialist is going to always know where their client situation is. And it's constantly evolving. Uh, some people are okay to take on a little bit more risk. Some people need to take on less risk. Some people need to make, maybe make a change in allocation. And it, it could be due to a variety of factors. Maybe they've had a, a life-changing event, for instance. Perhaps now they're retired. They need to invest their money differently. Or perhaps now they're taking R RMDs. Or they need to pay for some major medical cost. That could change the way the portfolio mix is and perhaps either reduce risk and, and take some risk off the table or perhaps increase just depending on their particular situation. Or just what seeing their statements drop like they did in March of 2020 with COVID-19. Some people walked away saying, oh my goodness, I need to lower my risk. I can't tolerate this. Other people said, no, that wasn't so bad. I want to be more aggressive. I want to take advantage of the opportunity, right? Yeah, that's right. Had a lot of those types of conversations. Uh, most people were stuck with the course, but once they saw it happen, then some people said, you know what? I really can't stomach quite this much risk. They want to take it off the table a little bit. But uh, yeah, good point. And Dave, uh, thanks again, and, and please stick around. But coming up after the break, I'll talk more about how today's markets holds new challenges for dividend investors, but also some new opportunities. I'm Westwood, the Income Guy, and you're watching the Retirement Income Show. Hi, I'm Wesley Wood, host of the Retirement Income Show, and I'm founder and president of Wood Financial Group. And we're a local independent financial services company that specializes in creating custom retirement solutions tailored to meet your particular needs. Visit retiretv.com to learn how we can help you create a customized retirement portfolio. Hey, welcome back. I'm Wes Wood, The Income Guy, and thank you for tuning in. Today, I'm giving you the straight scoop on dividends. And so far, we've covered some of the basics and talked about different ways to determine a good dividend strategy. But now, let's talk about dividend investing in today's market specifically. And as I mentioned earlier in our segments, the financial media tends to send a, a lot of mis mixed messages when it comes to dividend investing. And that was especially true during the coronavirus. The coronavirus exposed one of the biggest potential risks of dividend investing, which is the cuts and suspensions of those dividends. At the height of the pandemic last year, many companies began suddenly suspending and cutting their dividends to help protect their bottom lines. And as you might expect, most of those cuts occurred in industries that were destabilized in the crisis, like traveling and travel industries, food industries, and hospitalities like we had mentioned earlier. But on the flip side, there's actually companies that did well during the pandemic and companies that actually announced dividend increases. And again, these are mostly companies that made some, that made more, that were actually better and, and stable and more profitable during the pandemic. And, and all of this illustrates on why good dividend investing isn't simply a matter of just picking the winners and sticking with them. It's much more challenging than that. And as with any kind of stock market investing, there's a greater element of chance involved. 
And that's largely because things tend to change much more quickly and dramatically in the stock market than they do in the bond market. But at the same time, though, it also illustrates how the coronavirus triggered market changes that have led to new challenges for dividend investors, but also potential new opportunities. And I'm going to talk more about that with Dave in just a moment. But first, here's your chance to get a copy of my timely report, Investing for Income in the Stock Market. This report is a part of your free retirement income kit, which you can download by visiting retiretv.com or by calling me at 615-826-5749 and requesting it. But now, let's welcome back income specialist and the founder of the Retirement Income Store, David Scranton. Hey, Dave. You know, Wes, it's funny you talk about you know, dividend investing, and when you take preferreds out of the equation, the one thing we've got to be careful about is also realizing, as we saw last spring, right, when COVID-19 first hit, that some companies cut dividends, whereas other companies completely suspend their dividends. And that's why I made the comment that sometimes I use those strategies for more of the I want goals, not so much the I need goals, just in case they do get cut or suspended. Right. Right. It, it, it can happen in common stocks that pay dividends, um, can be great income generators in the dividend world. But the, like you said, the pandemic really illustrated where dividends can get cut, but also on the other side where dividends can go up. So, for instance, in, in food, hospitality, as well as travel, uh, take Boeing and there's a few other companies, for example, like Ford that actually had to cut their dividends during the pandemic. But on the other side, there's actually companies that uh, profited like Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, for in instance, that actually increase their dividends. So when investing in common stocks that pay dividends, you really got to be on top of it and know what's going on ep economically and how certain companies can be affected and what could happen to the dividend that our clients are receiving. Sure. And Marriott Corporation and Delta and a lot of companies really right. struggled you know, with that. And of course, they're their prices came back nicely for a lot of these, but but ultimately, if you're an income-based investor, you know you you care about the dividend, you know more more than anything. But you know, you, so you always talk about how it's difficult to to really pick these high dividend stocks. Um, but it's funny because I find that most people think that dividend stock picking is actually easier than going out trying to trying to pick growth stocks. I mean, do you hear the same thing when you talk to people? I do. I uh, hear that from, from a lot of folks, especially, uh, you know, the media. The media tends to kind of tell us that, hey, it's easier to, to buy dividends than it is for growth. But, you know, a lot of individual investors just don't need to be going out there and just buying a, a stock that happens to pay a large dividend. Uh, that's just not the way that it works. Uh, a lot of times it's easier to invest in growth stocks or growth mutual funds that um, that are built for growth because it's investing in a momentum. And a lot of times that's easier to do than investing for companies that we can rely on on their dividend payment. Because then you need to analyze and gather all the necessary data and really study the companies to make sure that we're picking companies that are paying solid dividends and we won't have to go through a situation where we're seeing cuts and, and other factors that could happen in the income generating world. That's right. Yeah, and because by definition, companies that pay a higher dividend are more mature companies. And, you know, they could be at the beginning stage of mature where they're still growing, or they could be at the ending stage of mature where maybe they're about to really start to go out of business. You know, like I was just in the last Kmart just about three months ago for a going out of business sale. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yep. So you got to really, uh, really study and, and look at all the necessary information before just jumping in and buying a company that happens to pay a very, very high dividend. That's right, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just about the numbers and the balance sheet and the income statement. You know, it's about understanding where that company lies in terms of its competitors, which is interesting because things are changing so quickly now with the recovery that, you know, say the same stocks that maybe were really attractive a year ago that have come up significantly it may not be the best ones that give you opportunity in the high dividend value-based investing world mm -hmm. for the next six or 12 months, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's not just studying and understanding the company, but it's also looking at the current uh, economic environment that we're in now. Um, just like going through the pandemic, we saw where companies were really negatively affected, but where some, some companies were 
positively affected. So uh, we also need to see what kind of industry they're in, where we are economically, where we're headed, not only economically, but politically. And then we can start doing our, our data gathering and really research and then look at buying which companies make the most sense to try to gather the great income that we can get out of those dividends. Yeah, I mean, you can argue that the next stage after the mature stage of a corporate life is the declining stage, and you don't want to get caught up in that. So, you know, it's kind of like if you stay at the roulette table long enough, you're going to lose money, right? Because double zero puts the odds in the house's favor. Exactly right, Dave. You're, you're nailing it. I couldn't have said it better than myself. And I want to say thanks, Dave, for joining us today. Hey, I'm Wes Wood, The Income Guy. Thank you for watching. And if you have any questions about anything we've covered on today's show, please reach out to me at RetireTV.com or by calling 615-826-5749. Hey, we'll see you again next week. fiduciary is someone legally obligated to act in your best interest. Doctors, lawyers, and some financial advisors are fiduciaries, but not all. When you work with Wes Wood and his team at Wood Financial Group, you are working with fiduciaries. They help clients create customized investment portfolios based off their retirement goals. If you're ready to work with a fiduciary, visit RetireTV.com and schedule a free, no obligation conversation with Wes or a Wood Financial Group advisor. Hi, I'm Wes Wood, founder of Wood Financial Group. Did you know that one simple mistake can derail your retirement plan? Could you be making that mistake right now? By not making the shift from growth-based to income-based investing, you could be setting up your retirement plan to fail. If you're at or near retirement age, time is not on your side. One market correction could wipe out your life savings. Make the switch today so you can preserve your assets and generate retirement income you can count on. Visit RetireTV.com to download your free retirement income kit from Wood Financial Group.